But now this brings us to the main point of our discussion with you, which is to get your advice for our viewers about what you consider to be the perfect portfolio. Now we know there's no such thing as perfect, but uh, I suspect that TIFs will play some role uh, in this. What would you say to the typical investor now, today, looking forward? How should we be managing our wealth? Well, let me, uh, I tried to cover this. The, the, you'd be surprised at some of the, what I've done in the asset allocation chapter of my book a little bit. Because I've come to the conclusion there's really not a very good answer. Mm. Uh, I've concluded that regular rebalancing is not terrible, but not necessary. Mm -hmm. uh, I've come to conclude that a 60-40 portfolio is probably the best option, mm -hmm. rather than going from 80-20 to 20-80 in a target retirement plan. Mm -hmm. And I may be right and I may be wrong on that. And I find it's something very individual uh, and, and, you know, and clearly I mean, everybody knows this intuitively at the beginning. There are no easy answers to this. Mm. So I'll come to exactly what I'm doing. Uh, but what I, was in, what I did, I got a letter from clearly a young man who was really worried about how he should be investing and what his allocation should be. And he said, you know, there's a dangerous, risky world out there. And he didn't mention it, but of course he's right. You have potential nuclear war global warming, much more than just potential, and racial division in the country uh, right now, uh, threats to world trade, uh, division of wealth all over the world, but most often well, very heavily in the U.S., between the haves and the have-nots. All those things are worth worrying about, but I said to him, you don't know, and I don't know, what's going to happen to any of them. The market doesn't know. Nobody knows. So you just have to put them out of your mind and forget it. What you want to think about is how much risk you can afford, and that's very much a personal thing, and uh, has a little bit to do with whether you're investing regularly and things like that. And then I said to him, if it's helpful to you, I will tell you what I'm doing. Now, I'm 88 years old and have an unusual kind of uh, planning my estate. Uh, and. Uh, I said, I'm 50% bonds and 50% stocks. I don't happen to rebalance around that. It just seems to come out that way, particularly in recent years. And uh, it, it's been higher than that and been lower than that. But right now, I'm very comfortable at 50-50. Hmm. Although I spend half my time worrying that I have too much in stocks <laughs> and the other half of my time worrying that I have too little in stocks. <laughs> and I think that's the way most investors feel. Mm -hmm. They don't know what the right number is. And when the market's going up, they say, God, why don't I have more than more in stocks when it's going down? So you're your own worst enemy in all this. Yes. But having some stability without automatically rebalancing, I don't think you need to do that. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's very clear, you know, and anybody understanding, economists certainly understands this, that the, more, the less you rebalance, the more you're going to have mm -hmm. because you're always selling the better performing asset. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and you don't know whether it'll do in the long run. But I also look at it as, as very importantly... Uh, and this is, this is kind of an interesting thing. I think the most important thing you need to know about the performance of the stock market in the next 30, 40, 50 years is what is the GDP of the United States going to do? Hmm. Corporate profits are correlated at 96%. S&P dividends are correlated at 96% with, with the GDP of the United States. The GDP doesn't grow quite as fast but not a big difference, 6.7 compared to 7.5 or something like that. Mm -hmm. And then they'd be nominal. And uh, so what, what interests me is in Peter Lynch's book, something about Wall Street, uh, one up on Wall Street or something, he says there's no number that could interest him less than the GDP number. Is it mm -hmm. going up or down? And what that is is a statement that the short term is more important than the long term. Mm. And I don't believe this, the short term is more important than the long term. Mm -hmm. And then you even get in Freakonomics. Mm -hmm. Those wise guys, they did a nice interview with me. I haven't heard all of it yet, but I will someday. Um, say, pay no attention to the GDP. Well, it's everything. Right. But it's not everything today and tomorrow. Right. You know, the GDP probably rose today about two, three hundred and sixty-fifths of one percent or something. <laughs> whatever it is, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, we don't pay any attention to it. But it all comes down to, for your, you know, the best portfolio, 
is are you an investor or are you a speculator? Mm -hmm. And if you're going to keep changing things, you are speculating because we can't know. Mm -hmm. If you're going to put commodities in there, the ultimate speculation. Mm -hmm. It has nothing going for it, no internal rate of return, no dividend yield, no earnings growth, no interest coupon, nothing except the hope, largely vain probably, that you can sell it to somebody else for more than you paid for it. How that could be even considered gold, let's say, an investment, mm -hmm. uh, I, I do not know. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, it's, I'd, I'd like to take the mystery out of it and say that uh, the perfect portfolio, first, I think for mm, a huge proportion, over 90% certainty of the investors, should be limited to marketable securities. Mm -hmm. They don't need the liquidity today but and we may have you know too much marketability and that is too much sensitivity to prices as they change day, day by day but you want to get out of the idea that you always have to do something mm -hmm. and uh, I have said in my books uh, you know something happens and Federal Reserve does something and the traders all at the beginning of the day think it's going to cause the market to get on so they sell and everybody else says that has nothing to do with anything for you and when you hear news and your broker calls up and says, do something, it's just tell them my rule is don't do something, just stand there. <laughs> <laughs> and it's, it's a lot of the rules that apply to the investment. They're not rules that apply to ordinary life. Right. And uh, so don't do something, just stand there. So get a rough idea of what you want to allocate your money to. Now, I, I do. I'm in really entirely indexed at my 50-50, uh, although all my... I can't give you the proportions because I don't remember them, but my uh, bonds that are in my retirement plan are bond index funds, and the bonds that are in my my uh, personal account are municipal bonds, Vanguard municipal bond, short and intermediate. And so I'm reasonably comfortable with that. So I think I'm too conservative for the average investor. So I'd say the perfect portfolio, and it, it should be, well, let me just mention one other issue. Uh, Try it a little bit differently. Uh, at Blair Academy, I have a scholarship fund that I'm allowed to manage, and I don't want to. I don't want to spend any time on it. And I don't. So here is exactly what I've done, on the assumption that nobody will touch it for a long time. Uh, when I'm gone, I mean maybe they will, maybe they won't. But what I did, this is probably 10 years ago, um, was say, put half of it in Wellington Fund and half of it in balanced index fund. The idea was not all in balanced index fund because there could be things that happen that a manager needs to adjust to. Neither of them have an international component and that's fine with me. That's, I believe that's the better strategy. So that's, and they would be together 90% of the fund. And then against two contingencies, um, just in case, I put 5% in emerging market index and I hope you're sitting down. 5% in gold. Really? Yeah, in, in the event, <laughs> just a 5% hedge against some kind of catastrophe. Mm -hmm. uh, now, I, I wouldn't call that the perfect portfolio, but I, I mention it only because that's one that, that is distinctive, meaning you cannot touch it. Mm -hmm. And uh, at least theoretically can't touch it. It's designed to be held through all extremes. Mm -hmm. And so that's going to give you, with the two balanced funds, uh, roughly 62% in equities. Mm -hmm. There's going to be, with Wellington Fund, more corporate bonds than the, than the index fund has. I think the index is something that we should be very, very careful about because it has, for the want of a better expression, too damn much in governments. Right. I don't think any individual would have an, a, a bond account 70% mm. in governments and 30% in corporates. Right. Maybe it should be the reverse. Mm. I think that makes more sense. Yeah. Can I prove that? No. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry, I can't. So it's looking at the long term, looking at the numbers, Looking at cost above all, there's no, there's no ideal portfolio, perfect portfolio that ignores cost. Now, you know, I've seen these articles saying, well, for example, commodities, no internal rate of return, silly, uh, including gold, except that's the, if nobody's going to, nobody looking and we have something explosive, that will help and it probably shouldn't hurt you too much. Mm -hmm. This portfolio actually had done rather well in the last couple of years mm -hmm. and it's fine in the long run. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, you know, I, and actually it may be doing better than my own, but I don't, but I don't look at my performance because I'm so conservative. Right. Uh, I, look at, I look at the funds yeah. 
Yeah, but it's almost all indexed. Yeah. And I do have Wellington Fund from those days with Mr. Morgan. Mm -hmm. And uh, I wouldn't give that up as a sentimental matter, but I, but I should. <laughs>